Hello, everyone. In this lecture, I want to uh, talk about one of the first steps that was taken towards um, quantum mechanics, and that's Bohr's model of uh, the hydrogen atom. If you need a reference for where some of this stuff comes from, basically any introductory physics text um, is good. I've got one of them at the bottom here. And then you can also take a look at Griffith's quantum mechanics section 4.2.2. So what I want to want to do is I want to go back in time to the uh, end of the 19th century and have a sense of the historical context of the way that atoms were understood at that time and how Bohr was able to solve some problems by his model of the atom. And we'll understand some of the predictions that his model makes. And then we'll eventually learn that his model is not exactly correct and how we need to, what steps we need to take to make it more physically correct. So at the end of the 19th century, uh, Maxwell had come up with his theory of electromagnetism, and it was a beautiful theory which uh, matched well with experiments. And uh, people thought that physics was pretty much wrapped up. There were a few nagging puzzles that people couldn't quite understand, and here are some of them. So if you take a gas um, and you pass a current through it, it gives off light. And then you kind of pass that uh, light through a spectrometer or a, a, you know, a grating, and you see that only a few wavelengths are in that, um, that light. And furthermore, each gas that you did this with, like if you did it for hydrogen or helium or mercury, you got a different set of wavelengths. And then sort of the reverse of that happens that if instead you shined a bunch of light through a gas of say hydrogen or helium or mercury, you would see the kind of reverse situation. You'd see that only a few wavelengths of light were taken out or absorbed by the gas. And this had been a mystery for a long time, for decades. People had observed this, but no one really understood what was going on with these gases. Why did they only emit certain wavelengths? Here's an illustration of that. You know, for example, in these, this emission spectrum here, this is a gas of mercury. Uh, when you pass a current through a gas of mercury at high voltage, you get you know, some wavelengths out. This is on a scale of 400 to 700 nan nanometers. So you get some purple wavelengths and a few yellow ones. Here's a red one. Just uh, this kind of seemingly random pattern of wavelengths, but not all wavelengths, only certain ones. If you did neon, for example, you get a different set of wavelengths. This is hydrogen. This is the one we're gonna talk about. This is an absorption spectrum. So if you shine white light through hydrogen, through a gas of hydrogen, you find that some of the wavelengths are missing on the other side. So it's absorbed only those four wavelengths. This is hydrogen, both absorption and emission. You see that if you excite a gas of hydrogen, you get those four wavelengths out. And then it, uh, if you shine white light through hydrogen, you have the same wavelengths which are missing. So this was a mystery. Nobody knew how to explain this. There was a formula that was uh, developed this one here um, was developed by this guy named Balmer, but he just kind of cooked up this formula by guessing, kind of stare at the data long enough for the hydrogen atom, and you label these, uh, these wavelengths with some integer, in particular 3, 4, 5, 6. And then you can eventually find that the wavelengths satisfy this equation with r being some constant. And this is the value of the constant. But this was an empirical formula. No one really understood why this was true. So that's the first puzzle is where are these, why only certain wavelengths? Why are the same wavelengths absorbed? Why does each gas have different ones? No one understood this. This is just a fun slide showing the um, things that you can find on the internet. This is a scarf, which is knitted to, to have a particular emission spectra for a certain element. And um, the great Christmas gift, if you have someone who's uh, physics inclined in your family, one day I want one of these things. The second puzzle that nobody understood in the 19th century was that nobody could explain why the atom was stable. So for example, we know that atoms are made of protons and electrons, which have an electrical attraction to each other. So why don't they crash into each other? So you would expect them to just crash together and then the, the atom would be neutral. So then you say, okay, maybe 
maybe the electron is orbiting around. Let's try some kind of planetary model where there's an attraction here, just like there's an attraction between the Earth and the sun, but the Earth is constantly orbiting the sun, and so it never actually falls into the sun. It's always falling around the sun. Maybe the same kind of thing is going on in an atom. This is the nucleus. There's the uh, electron. Maybe the electron is orbiting around the nucleus. There's one problem with this, which is that if you take the classical theory of electromagnetism and you have an accelerated charged particle, like an electron, you accelerate a charge, it emits light. It disturbs the electric and magnetic fields and the energy is given off as light. And we know light carries energy. So that means the electron must lose energy as it's accelerating. If it goes around, if it's orbiting around, it's constantly accelerating. You have centripetal acceleration. And so it should be constantly giving off energy and constantly losing energy and spiraling in towards the nucleus. That's what you would expect based on the classical theory at the time in the 19th century of what, um, what an accelerating charge would do. And to make matters worse, you can calculate how long it would take the electron to spiral in towards the nucleus. You can figure out how, how long would it take if it's accelerating to emit enough energy to have none left and crash into the nucleus. And that is um, 10 to the minus 11 seconds, which is disturbingly short. So why are we all still here? We've all lived you know, much longer than 10 to the minus 11 seconds. Atoms have been around for a, a really long time. So there's something wrong here. There's something we don't understand that classically, according to the theory of electromagnetism, that the, the atom should not be stable. So here comes Bohr. This is Niels Bohr, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1922 exactly for this, for his services in the investigation of the structure of atoms and of the radiation emanating from them, meaning the spectral lines. And here's his uh, attempt at explaining this. So he comes up with a model and here's his model of the hydrogen atom. So let's, let's imagine a hydrogen atom. Let's take this planetary model where the electron is orbiting around the proton in the center of the hydrogen atom. It has two assumptions. The first one is that the electron is orbiting in a circular orbit, this planetary model, okay? And from here, we can use classical physics, F equals ma. The force is the electrical attraction, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And I'll explain what this subscript N is doing here for, in a second. So that's the force between the electron and the proton. And then here I have MV squared over R, that's a, a centripetal acceleration. In this case, the Q1 and Q2 is the charge E. So the charge of the electron and the proton. So Ke squared over R squared is MV squared over R. So this is just an application of F equals MA to this system of a circular orbit with the attraction, electrical attraction between the proton and the electron. Now, the second assumption is the more wild one, which says that there's only certain orbits which are allowed. Basically, the electron can't be anywhere. It can only be in certain orbits. In other words, the problem was that it would spiral in towards the, uh, the nucleus, but Bohr just said it can't spiral. It can only be in certain places, and it can't be in between those places. So the spiraling is no longer allowed. By assumption, he just says, I'm going to assume that. And his condition for which orbits are allowed is this one here. MVRN is some multiple of H bar. H bar is Planck's constant. And then you say, well, why should I assume that? And it has something to do with angular momentum, but really it's just a, it's just a ad hoc assumption. Let's assume it and see what happens. So those are the two ingredients, circular orbits and this quantization condition that only certain orbits are allowed according to this condition in the blue box. That then N here is labeling the radius of the nth orbit. So N goes from one, two, three, it's some integer, positive integer. Let's derive the consequences of this model. First one is let's figure out which orbits are allowed. What are the radii of those orbits? So we'll start with the quantization condition, MVR is NH bar. That was the assumption from Bohr. And second step is solve for V. So the second line here, I'm solving it for V. 
And then just for convenience for later, I'm just going to square both sides. Okay, so I have this equation for v squared here on the left. But on the other hand, we have uh, the f equals ma equation. So kqq over r squared is mv squared over r. And this I can also solve for v. Okay, so I'm just solving for v squared on the right-hand side as well. I have two equations for v squared here. Let's set them equal to each other. So you set them to equal to each other and you solve for r, the radius, rn. And what you find is the equation down at the bottom here. rn, the radii of the allowed radii of the orbits is some constant, which is in the parentheses here, times n squared. So this constant here, the first, uh, the first radius or the lowest radius is n is equal to one. That's just equal to this constant. The second orbit is that constant times four because n is equal to two. The third orbit is that constant times nine because n is equal to three. You get the idea. What's the value of this constant? Put in some numbers and you find uh, this thing in, in parentheses is equal to this value, 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, about half an angstrom. We call it Bohr's radius, A0. So basically, the radii that Bohr predicts that the electron can be at are uh, A0 is the lowest one, uh, 4A0 is the second lowest one, 9A0 is the third lowest one, and so on. Also gives you a sense of the size of an atom, about, you know, half an angstrom, 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. So this is a prediction of his model. How about the energy level? So now let's try to think about the lines, the spectral lines. What's the total energy of the electron? Let's do some classical physics. One half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy between, the electrical potential energy between the electron and the proton, k e squared over r. Now I'm going to try to simplify this equation for the total energy. And I'm going to use again this equation that came from the f equals ma. Uh, mv squared is ke squared over r. And put that in here. So what do I get? I get um, the first term is ke squared over 2rn. The second term is just minus ke squared over rn. So that's one half of something minus one of something, which is equal to minus one half of something, ke squared over rn. But now substitute back in what we had for r, the radius. rn, the radius of the nth orbit, was this constant times n squared. So you see that the total energy goes like some constant over n squared. And when you plug the numbers in here, you get this formula. The energy of the nth level is minus 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared. So this is a very famous formula that came out of the Bohr model for the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. The lowest energy level is minus 13.6 eV. The second lowest energy level is minus 13.6 eV over four. A third lowest energy level is minus 13.6 eV over nine. You get the idea. Why is there a minus sign here? The minus sign is a reflection of the, the choice where the, the potential energy is zero. So we're saying that the, the potential energy is zero infinitely far away, meaning it takes energy to separate the electron from the proton. In other words, it takes 13.6 electron volts to bring an electron and a proton from the ground state or the lowest state of hydrogen out to infinity. That's what the minus sign is telling you there. And the amazing thing is that this agrees exactly with experiment. So the idea is that you have these levels and the, if the electron is in one of the levels, it can make a jump down to a lower level and emit a photon, which has the right energy equal to the difference between the upper and the lower energy levels. And conversely, if I have an atom which is in a lower level, EL, L stands for lower here. If I send a photon in with the right energy, the electron can absorb that photon and knock it up to a higher energy level, EU. U stands for upper. 
you can predict a bunch of possible energies that can be given off when an electron makes a transition between one state and another state. So you've got all these possible transitions, you know, five down to one, n equals five down to n equals one, that has a certain photon energy associated with it. Well, a, a photon with a certain energy will come out and four down to one, different energy, three down to one, a different energy, six down to two, a different energy and so on. Now, all of these photons, the ones that are brown here, uh, are not visible. They're outside of the visible range of humans. But these four, the ones that end up in n equals two, are visible. And those are exactly the four wavelengths that show up when you pass a current through hydrogen. You see those exact same wavelengths. So this formula here, along with the idea that when I make a transition from one energy level to another, giving off a photon leads to exactly the right wavelengths to solve the puzzle of why only those four wavelengths are emitted for hydrogen. There's a really great visualization tool here. Um, you can Google FET, P-H-E-T, and then hydrogen atom. And this sort of helps you to visualize what's going on in Bohr's model. Okay, so there's something right about Bohr's model, for sure. It gets the energy levels right. It agrees with experiment. But then if you step back, you think, wait a second, it's got this classical physics in it. And then he just put in this assumption that only certain energy levels were allowed or only certain orbits were allowed. And what's the real reason behind that assumption? It uh, doesn't, it's not really that well motivated. So he has something right, but it's not exactly the correct model that we understand today. We know now that this model is not correct, that the electron does not orbit in a perfectly circular orbit. Okay, it's not at all correct. So that picture you should uh, not have in your mind. We'll see the more correct picture later on. In fact, if you know a little bit about quantum mechanics, you know that that's gonna violate the uncertainty principle. If I have a definite radius for the electron, that means I know it's sort of radial position exactly. And uh, you know that's not possible in quantum mechanics. So we need a better explanation. And the better explanation is we need to solve the Schrodinger equation. And so that's where uh, the next step to get a better understanding of how we correctly, how we now understand the electron in a hydrogen atom is behaving. But this is a first step and at least it gets you familiar with the energy levels uh, in a hydrogen atom, which agree with experiment. And so whatever we do with the Schrodinger equation, it better also agree with experiment and match this formula here. So let me summarize the results of Bohr's model. Basically only certain energy levels are allowed in the hydrogen atom and the, the energy that comes out of his model is that the energy of the nth level is some constant divided by n squared minus 13.6 eV over n squared. And that agrees with experiment when we look at the wavelengths that are emitted by a hydrogen gas when you pass a current through it. The reason that agrees is that basically you have only these certain energy levels that are allowed and then you have uh, transitions between the levels which require a certain energy photon to be absorbed or emitted in order to conserve energy. But then remember that Bohr's model is not exactly correct. So we need to go a little bit further in order to really understand what the electron is doing inside of a hydrogen atom. We need to solve Schrodinger's equation and we'll pick it up there next time. Thanks everybody for listening. I hope you found this useful. Bye for now.